Hi everyone, I'm Jack the Rambling Raconteur, and this weekend I read The Ballad of Black Tom by Victor Laval. And I was, I really enjoyed this book. I, I was fascinated by it. It's a book I know I'm going to reread. It's cosmic horror. Uh, it's technically a novella, but it's 150 pages, so it's a substantial novella. It was really well written, um, and it presents a side of cosmic horror that I've never found before. I've been reading cosmic horror for 16, 17 years. I've read a fair amount of it. I really enjoy the subgenre, and this presented something I'd never seen. And, and that is the identity of the main character is not one that I've found in the, the cosmic horror stories and books that I've read. Uh, it's in complete intertextuality with H.P. Lovecraft's The Horror at Red Hook. It, Detective Malone, Robert Sidem, who are sort of the main two characters of that story, are very present in this uh, book. But it adds a twist, and the twist is that it adds the character of a 20-year-old uh, black man who's living in Harlem and plays guitar and becomes an associate of Robert Sidem's. He interacts with Detective Malone, and he's the real main character of the story. His name's uh, Tommy Tester, or Black Tom. And uh, seeing that side of this cosmic horror book w was really interesting. It, it put such, it was that simple twist, but it put such a, a unique uh, spin on what we think of in cosmic horror. And there are, I'll read a pair of passages. There are examples where Laval is clearly someone who's read Lovecraft, who has read the other like Thulhu Mythos writers, and he appreciates what they can do, but he adds in this idea of there are other like realistic horrors, real horrors that characters encounter um, and that people encounter. And he asks the question through his main character, uh, Tommy, um, what, what is more horrifying? That cosmic horror, that indescribable, you know, just enough brush strokes to tell you that there's something you don't want to see more of? Or is it, and, and the cosmic indifference, or is it, uh, is the horror of real life that people encounter, specifically like racism, uh, is that worse? And that's what uh, Laval is kind of pushing on. Like that's what he wants us to explore as we experience this really well-told tale. So I want to give two examples of uh, his writing. So here's the first one. <clears throat> there is a king who sleeps at the bottom of the ocean. As Sidem said this, against all possibility, the window panes took on the color and apparent depth of the sea. It was as if Tommy Tester and Robert Sidem, standing in this room, in this mansion, in this city, were also peering down at distant wa waters elsewhere on the globe. The guitar fell out of Tommy's hand as the image appeared. The thump it made, the sour note that played once, these hardly registered. A rush of cold bones seemed to enter not only the room, but also Tommy's bones. Sidem said, the return of the sleeping king would mean the end of your people's wretchedness. And he goes on, Sidem tapped the window again, and the ocean, truly Tommy was seeing a vast and distant sea in the windows, churned, heaved, and from its depths a shape too massive to be real stirred. Tommy's throat tightened. He didn't want to see this. He thought he might shatter the wall of the windows with his own hands if that thing in the sea depths became visible, distinct. But then the image shifted, the perspective rising, leaving the sea far below. They left the continents behind. Was it possible? They left the world. They rose into the night sky. It really seemed as if these two men in a house in Flatbush were now adrift in farthest space. Tommy Tester clutched at the window sill for balance. From here, you might understand, Robert Sidem said quietly. And you, so you get that that aspect of like, <laughs> of what, you know, I, I that's something that you could have read in Weird Tales in the 1930s. Uh, here's another example. <clears throat> Malone nearly gasped. Was it Mr. Howard's tone, his words, or the glimpse of the woman who'd opened the door just enough? Since Malone stood farther back from the house than Mr. Howard, he saw her silhouette inside. At the doorway, a stooped, slim woman had appeared, her nose prominent, hair pulled back tightly. But behind that woman, Malone swore he saw, what, more of her. Some great bulk trailed behind her, off into the distance of the gloomy front hall. Nearly anyone else, once not so sensitive, so attuned, would have dismissed this as a trick of the shadows. A bit of bent light. Insensitive minds always dispel true knowledge. But Malone couldn't ignore the sense of her length, of a largeness, behind the figure of this woman at the door. Not a second presence, but the rest of hers. Malone brushed his hair back again, if only to disguise the quivering of his right hand. Um, and so you, could, you, you really get the sense. Laval knows how to write the cosmic horror, but he, he wraps all of this up with you know, that, that character of a 20-year-old black man in New York who faces daily danger as he's riding the subway. 
he's accosted by the conductor. What stop are you getting off at? You know, when he gets off uh, and he's been paid to come to Sidem's house and play uh, his guitar at a party there, there's a group of like uh, white teenagers who come along behind him and they start like kicking in his shoes, kicking in his guitar case, and then they escalate. They start chasing him, they're threatening him, and he's running for his life. And so there's a palpable real danger there. Um, there's someone who's close to him who's shot by a police officer, uh, well, without any weapons. Um, and, and so we get scenes in Harlem, we get this sense of characters who know that, that going to Brooklyn or, or taking the subway this, you know, this far south in the city can be dangerous for them. But that is, that is sort of in a dialogue and a conflict with the cosmic, you know, indescribable horror. And Lovecraft famously pushed that idea that the, the scariest thing, the most horrifying thing, would be a creature, a cosmic being of great power that was completely indifferent to humanity and completely indifferent to life on Earth. And what Laval presents is that might be true, but if in your life you're faced with real horror, with, you know, life or death situations, plural, uh, and that it's something that you know you encounter regularly, maybe that indifference is, cosmic indifference is better than, you know, active malice from fellow humans. And that's that's the question that is presented within the book. And I think it's presented really well. Laval is never, like, beating us over the head with it. He doesn't go out right out and say, like, you know, H.P. Lovecraft was obviously racist. That's self-evident if you read his stories. Um, and... He never go, like goes out of his way to say that. He just presents characters in a realistic 1920s setting, and then he lets them interact. We have a, a victorious society in Harlem that is the, the food that's described there, the way that the interactions are there, absolutely fantastic. It's dynamite. Like I want, I want more. Laval has written other books, but I want more of this cosmic horror set in 1920s New York. It was fascinating. It was so well done. Um, so I, I think it's clear. I loved this book. I'm excited to reread it. I don't know when. It's short enough it'll be just, you know, like an easy afternoon or weekend read. But um, if, you've, if you've never read this and you've read the horror at Red Hook, uh, I think you would find the connections that are there. If you enjoy cosmic horror, again, I think it's the type of book you might enjoy. The next cosmic horror I'll probably read will be um, The Room of the Morning by William Sloan. And specifically the first uh, book within this is called To Walk the Night in part because it ends in uh, Arizona. It has its climax in Arizona here. And then two books that sort of came to mind as I was reading this are other writers who wrote, who sort of inserted their, uh, their personal experiences into like larger narratives that exist, have existed. So one would be Charles Chestnut. I may do a video uh, this coming week or next weekend on some of his stories, but he was writing um, as, as a black man in the late 19th century. And he lived in the South. And so he presents a, uh, a very different take on what we consider sort of like the, the African American uh, folk tales that were collected, you know, there were sort of like the Uncle Remus tales, which when white authors collect them, presented this uh, uh, utopian ideal uh, on the plantations, which were horrifying. And Chestnut writes a series of stories that act as an excellent, excellent corrective to that. Um, but the other one that jumped to mind sort of is, is you know, twisting a, a well-known story in, with deep intertextuality and someone who cares about that story but makes you think about it in a different way is uh, Gene, uh, Gene Reese with White Sargasso Sea and how it, you know, shifts your thinking around uh, Jane Eyre and sort of all of those Victorian romance novels when you consider what was going on in the Caribbean at that time. The other thing I'll say, and I'll try to find uh, like links, videos of, or audio recordings of the songs to link to it, but um, Laval is, Im imbues the book with some different uh, music examples. One would be the famous uh, John the Revelator song, Who's That Right in John the Revelator? Um, so I'll try to find it, maybe Sunhouse is recording that. And then uh, some of the, uh, in grief at one point, Tommy plays like almost like wordless uh, jazz or blues guitar music. And so it made me think of um, Blind Willie Johnson's Dark Was the Night. So I'm going to try and find that link as well. But if you've, if you've ever read Victor Laval or if you really enjoy Cosmic Horror, just let me know in the comments. I, I, I loved it. <laughs> Thanks. Bye.